So I think we're going to get going here. Uh, welcome to the second of three sessions during our 2020 Golf Week Architecture Summit here at Pinehurst Resort. The purpose of this session is to focus a little bit more about storytelling. And before introducing our uh, glorious panelists this evening, I wanted to uh, put a little context around our approach this week that maybe I didn't do last night when we were with Tom Pashley. So if you were at the summit last year at Streamsong, you'll notice that we talked a lot when we were at Streamsong about Streamsong. So it follows that while we're at Pinehurst, we're talking a lot about Pinehurst. That's sort of how it goes. And last year, we, we interviewed uh, and spoke with the leading builders who built those three courses, the shapers who are actually on the machines and uh, build all the bunkers and all that, and then also the caretakers who like Bob Farron, the director of agronomy, are left behind when the architects leave and actually make the thing stay alive. And so I thought it was important to point out that even in a context like we had last year where the focus was very much on architecture, we had one of the absolute highlights from Jeff Bradley, who's a shaper with Corin Crenshaw, who we had on the screen pictures of uh, different pieces of equipment and we were hoping that our shapers would give us really meaningful insights into how they use these tools of the trade. And so we put up a picture of a mini excavator on the screen, and Jeff Bradley, when he was asked, what do you do with that, said, well, I make a hole. And that was it. <laughs> and then we put up a picture of a big excavator. And I said, well, what do you do with that, Jeff? And he said, I make a bigger hole. <laughs> So even best laid plans to talk about serious architecture things don't necessarily go as you might hope. So what we were hoping to do in this series, by having Tom Pashley last night, by having these three storytellers tonight, and by having Bob Farron and Robbie Zalznick later on talking about championship golf, is to take a slightly different look at architecture and to understand that there needs to be an owner and a leader that makes decisions about hiring the architect. And I think last night with Tom, the point was to understand how the decision to redo number two came about, how the decision to go ahead with number four came about, the cradle, all that sort of stuff. With these panelists tonight to talk about how storytelling and the stories we tell ourselves about these places have an influence on the perception that we have, whether it's related to architecture or not. And then with Bob and with Robbie tonight to talk about inside the ropes and outside the ropes, how a US Open golf course is set up because it has very much to do with architecture, even though we might not be talking specifically about placement of bunkers or angles into greens. So the point of all of this is to talk about, in a broad sense, that architecture does not exist in just a vacuum. It touches and relates to so many other parts of what operating golf courses and, and golf resorts are all about. So just for a little context. How'd I do, Pete? How'd I do? <laughs> So um, just make sure the microphones are switched on. I'll introduce our panel tonight of storytellers. Uh, first to my right, I have uh, Richard J. Moss, who I've never called Richard J. Moss in his entire life. He's been known since college as Pete Moss. True story. And uh, full disclosure, Pete was a professor of mine in college. He's a great player, great historian of the game, uh, for many years was a professor of history at Colby College, and retired to Pinehurst a number of years ago. Plays great golf, uh, talks about it, thinks about it, and has been a great influence on me. And he's written a book about Pinehurst called Eden in the Pines. So that qualifies him to at least be sitting at this table tonight. Uh, Audrey Moriarty, in the middle, is the executive director of Given Tufts, which is the memorial library here in Pinehurst. So if you go out this door, turn left, and walk down the street, you run right into it at the very top of the Village Green. I've known Audrey for a long time through uh, USGA stuff and collaboration with the Tufts Archives because it's really one of the great and leading research centers for architecture in the entire game of golf, located right here in Pinehurst. And in addition to all of the work that she does helping out researchers and people who are interested in understanding more about Donald Ross and architecture and all these other things, she's the author of a book called Pinehurst, uh, Golf, History, and the Good Life, which is a pictorial history of the village, and knows so much about the place. And then finally, we have at the far end, uh, Lee Pace, who is a very, very well-known golf writer, author, and historian here in the Carolinas, having written a number of books about Pinehurst, but also been commissioned to do commemorative histories for clubs all throughout the Carolinas, from Pine Needle and Mid Pines to down uh, currently at Biltmore Forest, 
in Asheville and is a premier storyteller when it comes to understanding the Pinehurst stories. So those are our three panelists for this evening. So the first question, and we're going to do a little bit of mixture of um, general questions that each of you can pick up on or specific questions for individuals. Um, what would Pinehurst be without Donald Ross and vice versa? Floor is open. Um, it'd be less Scottish because I think the one thing that he did was to, you know, obviously come here to Massachusetts and then to Pinehurst and bring the traditions of, of the Scottish course and Scottish attitudes. Uh, to and what are some examples here in Pinehurst and how that plays out? Uh, That's hard. I, I, th I think he recognized what Tufts was doing, that it was a course, and ultimately courses, associated with a village. And like Dornick is associated with Dornick. Uh, Pinehurst is associated with Pinehurst. I mean, you know, the, the chapel, uh, the I don't want to get into this, the Protestant nature of, of the culture and the place. Uh, he brought all that, and then he brought a, a Scots with him uh, as assistant pros and so on. Uh, and, uh, and he ran the place in a very Scottish way for a long time. And of course, he, he owned the pine, uh, the pine crest, uh, and he put an impress on the pine crest that was Scottish to the point that Scottish symbols are on the stationery uh, of the place. But that's my bit. I think I would say that um, one thing, much like Cor and Crenshaw with what Mr. Dedman did when they came, was Ross kind of had carte blanche here. There was so much open land. And there were, the early visitors had clamored for some golf. And the first nine holes, whatever were done by you know a guy who'd been to Scotland or I know a guy that sort of thing and once the Tufts heard about James Walker Tufts heard about Ross he came here and that um, James Walker Tufts as far as I knew never played a round of golf he was interested in a croquet game like Roke and um, lots of walking and and things like that but I don't believe he ever golfed and it was not his original intent to be a golf course he was going to be a gentleman farmer have peach farms and um, people taking the cure getting over consumption which in about a year he found out was actually tuberculosis was contagious and that's what gave golf the opportunity to catch to take off because they had had to find something for all these people to do, and the people who came from the East were already playing golf. And so I think it was just a combination. And the longer he was here, the more famous he came throughout, up and down the Eastern seaboard. And um, it, it just, it kind of was a ball that just kept rolling, I think. To me, what's fascinating is the prospect of the series of coincidences that needed to fall perfectly for Donald Ross to actually get here. Um, for a couple of the books that I've done for the resort here, uh, I actually went to Dornick um, just to dig into the, the Ross story, the Dornick story, the Scottish golf story. And on one of my trips, I was at Royal Dornick Golf Club and was looking at a framed portrait of a very distinguished looking man there in the club. and. One of the members came up to me and said, that's John Sutherland, who was a longtime secretary of the club. And he found out where I was from. He recognized my accent. I s said I was writing a book about Pinehurst. And he said, oh, um, um, Donald, uh, Donald Ross and John Sutherland flipped a coin to go to America. Donald Ross won the, the coin flip. And so he went to America. And John Sutherland stayed back in Dornoch to run the, uh, the golf club. And so, and, and the man totally um, vouched for the story because his mother was friends with Donald, with John Sutherland's daughter. 
and had heard that story many times. And it just so happened that when Ross did come to America, he wound up in Boston. He was in Boston only because he met a professor from Harvard who was a regular visitor to Dornick. And uh, Professor Robert Wilson invited him, said, if you ever come to America, look me up. And he did. And Wilson happened to be a member of a club called Oakley Country Club in the Boston suburbs. Another member there was James Walker, was Leonard Tufts, who was the son of James Tufts, the founder of Pinehurst. So the Tufts had just decided that they were going to build a golf course and, and open up golf in Pinehurst because it was not part of the original equation. So Leonard Tufts was looking for somebody who knew something about golf, which was a very young sport and nobody knew anything about it in America. And he happened to make the acquaintance of this young man from Scotland who was only 29 years old at the time. So he's, and, and Ross had gotten a job at Oakley Country Club, but in Boston he could only work there in the summer. So he had nothing to do in the winter. Well, Pinehurst was created as a winter resort. So you had the coincidence of the coin flip, of Ross coming to America and landing in Boston where he met Leonard Tufts who invited him here. So Donald Ross comes here and finds this sandy soil and the pine straw and the, and the wire grass that reminds him of the Lynx style golf course in, in Scotland and the, and the winds there. And it, it felt very natural to him. So it's just this fascinating series of coincidence of dominoes that had to fall perfectly for Donald Ross to wind up in Pinehurst. Do you think there are any other places in golf that are so closely associated with an individual architect as Pinehurst is with Ross? I would certainly think not because of the volume of work that he did. I mean, he did seven, seven courses at one time, uh, four here at the at Pinehurst, Mid Pines, Pine Needles, and Southern Pines Country Club. What, uh, Audrey, what are some of the from some of the architecture resources that the Tufts Archives offers, and what are some of the requests that you get from people who, who have an interest in learning more? Well, we're very fortunate to have the largest collection of Donald Ross at memorabilia. It comes to us from a lot of different places from the courses themselves, but the majority of it came to us from the Donald Ross Society. And we have folders on the Ross courses that has information, clippings, articles, and whatnot. But the things that the architects really appreciate is we have a lot of whole drawings and course layouts, originals, most of them, and a lot of copies. But they can come and can see them. We don't normally let people handle the originals, but we have great copies and we have notebooks people can open them up and sit and study. We have lots of people who come in and use, use our services that way. We have a lot of people actually like Chris Spence, Corin Crenshaw, um, Gil, Gil Hans came in. A lot of golf course architects come in, but a lot of them call me and say, Audrey, what have you got on um, Raleigh Country Club or something? You know, or somebody's looking for a job and they go, what, can I see the drawings or do you have this and that? We have most of it scanned, so we do a lot electronically. A lot of courses call and say, we have a Donald Ross grill, we gonna want to hang these pictures up or we're going to create an homage to him somewhere. So. That's a lot, and we get a lot of random stuff too, like somebody will call and say, is the number six hole on Aronimic still a dog leg? No, I just made that up. But so we have to check and say, well, I don't think so, it wasn't then, I don't know, or you know, just sort of, some, some's really random. And a lot of people come in and say, do you have anything on Seoto, where I live? And they go, yeah, we pull out the stuff. So it, we, we serve a lot of different people, people who have idle curiosity, people who want to learn more about their clubs, people like Lee who are writing course histories. Um, the Donald Ross Society has also tried to get a course historian at most of them. They come and do research from us. And so it's really a lot of different people, but you know, because we have the stuff electronically in the archives, and we also on our website have an online virtual exhibit where you can call up a golf course and you can see what we have in the building, so um, a lot of people use our services that I might not even know about. 
Pete, in addition to your interest in uh, studying Pinehurst, you're a member of Pinehurst Country Club. What, um, how would you describe the courses and how fellow members sort of peg their personalities going through the list? Okay. Uh, everybody hang on to your hat. Here come nutshells. Uh, number one, the members think, is a place where you feel like you're playing in 1900 or 1910, that it's the most authentic of the courses. Number two is very frustrating for the members. Uh, members with handicaps over 15 really don't play there very much. Number three has been made unplayable for the most part by recent changes. Members will not play it uh, unless they absolutely have to. Number four is in the process of being reappraised by the members. The fact that uh, carts are not allowed on the fairways uh, for older members has been a, a negative for that, but otherwise I think the reviews have been very good. Number five is uh, a, a member favorite. Uh, it's, uh, it's again has that little bit of sense of Ross authenticity. Number six is probably the favorite members course, uh, if you could blow up a few houses. Uh, number seven is not appreciated much at all. It's generally thought of as a poorly designed course, particularly the first four or five holes. It's always been the wettest of the courses. Number eight's a favorite uh, and is hard to get on because it has so much resort play. Number nine is uh, unique in that it's a Nicholas course uh, and it is the only course uh, of the nine uh, that still has bent grass greens. Capsuled enough for you? Very well All done. Right. Anything else? I think the members uh, are always uh, aware of the fact, and this is just the dominating fact, that we're shoulder to shoulder with resort guests, and we're always negotiating that very difficult relationship. So, you know, people, resort guests are trying to play on the courses, we're trying to play on the courses. Um, and uh, winter and summer are high seasons for the members. Uh, spring and fall are high seasons for the resort guests. You didn't mention the cradle. Well, the, the cradle, uh, it's my, my opinion and the members' opinion. First of all, it's, a, it, it's been an unbelievable success. However, and I know that David and I have talked about this endlessly, that if you were trying to create a course that introduced people to golf, you wouldn't build a cradle. It's too hard. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the practice course at Pine Needles. That's what Pinehurst needs. It needs a, a simple introductory course. Number three members believe, and I believe, could have easily been that and isn't. Could have been an introductory course for, for kids and, and uh, beginning players, uh, for older players, and so on, but it, it just didn't turn out that way. What obviously it sounds like the members are actively discussing architecture. Oh, yeah. Did that come as a surprise to you moving down here? No, no. I mean, you're down here, and, and I think the other thing the discussion expands out. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, this isn't mine. Uh, I have a friend of mine who was a member who said, I asked him what his favorite course was, and he said, Pine Needles which is, of course, not a, you know, uh, I think a lot of people would say that. I think uh, between number two and Pine Needles, you get almost a 50-50 vote on which course is better. Well, and what I find interesting about that is that when you go to St. Andrews and you talk to locals and they disparage the old course, yeah. they love the Jubilee because they think it's the hardest, they have mixed feelings about the castle. Everybody thinks that the new is generally the best course that nobody plays. And so it's just so interesting that we have this outsider perspective of what the best course is, and yet oftentimes it doesn't line up at all with the yeah. people who are there day in, day out for yeah. whatever reasons. I, I think members and, and people down here are well aware now that Pine Needles and Mid Pines has added Southern Pines Country Club to its it now has three courses that it offers, and I think a lot of people are looking forward to, or are, are, are going to be really interested to see if that mounts some sort of 
real competition uh, for uh, uh, for the courses. Um, you know, but when you come down here, they're, they're, and you and it expands out of that. A lot of people are very fond of a course called the Legacy, which I don't know that uh, uh, that's a Nicholas course as well. Uh, mostly his son, as I understand it. Uh, Tobacco Road can get you into a fight. Uh, uh, people either love it or hate it. And, and you're right, David. With, I, 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 with so many courses and so many choices, it seems obvious that you'd have discussions. You'd have favorites and not favorites. So, Lee, given how much you've seen and traveled and studied in the Carolinas, what do you think are some elements of the Pinehurst courses and the Pinehurst area courses that that other places can learn from and what are elements that are just sort of specific to here and don't travel in your experience? Well the um, obviously the sand is what sets all these courses apart as, as Pete mentioned uh, that you can't replicate that in the mountains you can't replicate that in um, Charlotte, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Durham. Um, so it's a t totally different thing. I mean, th there, there is no, there is no other Pinehurst. I mean, there's there's only one. I mean, it's between the history, the ambiance, um, the um, um, the style of golf course. Um, I mean, I. I I'm honestly not sure there's a lot you can learn from other than, mm -hmm. and, and there aren't that many resorts. There's not that much golf resort play elsewhere in North mm -hmm. Carolina. You've got to go down to the coast, um, to, to Myrtle Beach, to Hilton Head, to Kiowa, to get really into the golf resort business. The rest of North Carolina is public courses or private country clubs. So th these these are different animals here because they are Resorts and, in the case of Pinehurst here, a, a private club. You know, trying to trying to do both. Audrey, there've been a variety of different owners and stewards of Pinehurst through the years. In what ways do you think that each of the different major owners, that their their personality or their focus has been reflected in the development and the maintenance of the courses? Uh, as I mentioned previously, I don't think James Walker Tufts had a plan for golf in the beginning. And when he died, his son Leonard is the one who helped get Ross to the resort, but that's after people had sort of clamored for golf. And, but his, his important job at the time was that the resort had grown so fast and so much, he had to feed people, he had to entertain them, he had all these things he had to do, and he was very involved in transportation in the state of North Carolina was responsible for building better roads. He was really into animal husbandry, got um, Ayrshire cattle from England and purebred hogs from the Vanderbilts at Biltmore. So that was his main focus. It's sort of mechanical. And Richard, who was uh, Leonard's son, his Donald Ross was about the same age as his dad. And he learned, to, he grew up walking the courses with Ross and playing with him. And he was he's, um, was a golfer from his early years and was a good player. And he was very, he's an icon in the USGA. He was very instrumental in the, he was on the first Greens Committee. He was um, on the committee that standardized the rules of golf. He was very interested in improving the courses all the time, and he was really the one, he was the president of the USGA in 56 and 57, and he brought a lot of better qualities to the golf here. And so the Tufts, at the end, they were, golf was their game. It didn't start out that way, but that's the way it ended with Richard. And then when Diamond Head, when the Tufts, the younger Tufts didn't really want to run a resort, and so they sold to Diamond Head, and it was a real estate division of the McLean Trucking Company. And he's the man who sort of invented um, container, container trucks and things. And so he, was, he had a lot of money. He was a North Carolinian, right? And um, but anyway, they were more interested in developing um, real estate, selling real estate, building homes, and expanding that part. And they didn't do much with the golf courses at all. In fact, they did very little. And so as the good fortune of the resort went down, the, the last thing they cared about were the golf courses. 
And so when Club Corporation of America, the Denman family bought the resort, they started pumping money into the resort and making, trying to improve the quality of the guest experience, all that sort of thing. So um, that, was, that was their sort of modus operandi and the Holly Inn was, was um, abandoned at the time and they began taking little chunks and making it better. And then, of course, Bob Dedman was, was the one who had the vision after his father died. He divested himself of all the Club Corps stuff except for Pinehurst. And he had the vision and the nerve to have Cor and Crenshaw come and totally change look of number two. And it was really, it was really a bold step. And um, they came, Bill Cor and Ben Crenshaw wanted to come to the archives and see what, what they were trying to determine what the appropriate era, era was to take the golf course back to. And so they came, they came one night, and Bob, you were there. That, uh, everybody was there. We had about 10 people in there. And I just put, start clicking on pictures. Here's, here's the 11th hole, click, click, click. And, and Ben would go, print that one, print. So I'm just sending this stuff to the printer. And they, they picked they kind of picked an era that they wanted to represent. So we started pulling out all those pictures. And they said, well, we'd like to see your drawings. We go, At, they don't really exist. For the majority of the courses right here that, that he worked on, he just was out there and said, we need to shape this up here and do that. And we, there aren't really drawings. And so I didn't have much to show him. And I said, you know, I've got a drawing. I pulled it out. It was an irrigation from 1962 when they had, they were working for, I believe it was, uh, not the PGA, what was it? The yes, the amateur, thank you. And they, so it showed the irrigation and it was just one pipe right down the middle. And they're like, that's what we want, thank you. So they looked at that, all you guys were looking at that, and they were really psyched to get that drawing. And then that showed them, this is where the water doesn't go. And that's where they decided this is going to be wire grass, this is going to be natural. But it was really kind of a fun thing to sit there and watch, watch it evolve at the Tufts archives because we have about, not only do we have the drawings, we have about 195,000 images from the village, from the first days of the village, and, and lots of people golfing. So you can look at those pictures, and they're organized by courses and holes and say, oh, that's what it looked like then, or that's why they changed that, whatever. So that's kind of the way I see that golf developed, and it's pretty much at its apex right now, I would say. Yeah, as, as students of, of these golf courses, um, is there another point to look to when for resort guests or for members that the golf courses might have been as appealing or more appealing than yeah. they are right now? Pete, what do you think? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's a matter of water. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of architects, and I know Gil Hance thought so, uh, that the Pinehurst courses are too wet, even though they're built on sand. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with pop-up greens. Uh, the old number four, the number four that's now been transformed, was defined by pop-up greens almost inevitably with like a 20-yard downhill roll-off off the front. And at the bottom of that roll-off would be a swamp, would be a casual water. Uh, inevitably, uh, and he went out there and, and took most of that out. Uh, the most dramatic example is the third hole of number four. That hole used to go out and go straight down into a valley that had to be 30 or 40 feet deep, then went 30 or 40 feet up to the green. Well, Hans filled that entire valley in. With, I, don't, I don't know what he filled it in with, but he filled it in. And, he's, and, and as you go around, you will see that the, the old number four uh, has been flattened. The idea was to dry it out. And the open, when it was here for women and men, was, an, I thought, an incredible experiment in drying a course out. Here's the facts of the matter. When they dried the course out, it was easier to play than it is when they're watering it. Uh, Keimer putted from places where pros never would putt from because the edges were dry and the grain had gone out of them. It was as simple as that. Uh, try chipping off one of those, those uphill lives uh, when they've been pouring water on the greens. It's impossible. You can't play it. 
And the best thing that happened to me was I was following Michelle Wee the last day in the last couple of holes. On the 18th hole, which was drier than a bone, she hit a three iron and I marked in my mind where that ball landed and where it ended up. And later, a couple of days later after the open, I went out there, that three iron carried in the air 140 yards and rolled 90 yards. And she hit a half wedge into the 18th green. Try doing that today, you can't do that. They dried that course out and, and then there was this terrific response. Oh my God, the course is abandoned. It's awful, it's not green. And there's, there's been this conflict ever since between the drier, faster, harder golf course and these green, lush, emerald things that seem to be what people need to have for marketing. But I'll tell you what, one of the big issues when you go to these courses is how wet they are and, and how much more playable they'd be if they were drier. Thoughts, Lee? Well, one thing about the evolution of the of the owners over the years, Audrey mentioned Diamond Head that owned the, the resort from 1971 through 82 when it lost it to the banks. Uh, I abhor what Diamond Head did from a real estate perspective on the west side of the highway over around three and five, but I don't think they get credit for their vision to bring competitive golf back to Pinehurst. Uh, i.e. the U.S. Open and um, competitive events like that. The Pinehurst had been the home for what was considered a major championship for 50 years in the first part of the 1900s, the North and South Open. But Richard Tufts over the years began disillusioned with the attitude of the pros, them wanting more money, wanting this, wanting that. And so he discontinued the, uh, the North and South after the 1951 event and for over 20 years, Pinehurst did not have any major professional golf event, and it was the young president of Diamond Head, Bill Maurer, who was at the Masters in the early 70s and said, it's a shame that an event of this stature is not played at Pinehurst every year. You know, we had that, but we gave it up. So it was his idea to create, in 1973, what was called the World Open which was a very um, risky event. It was 144 holes over two weeks with a half million dollar purse and $100,000 to the winner. And it was held in November 1973. Miller Barber won it. And Ben Crenshaw finished second in it. It was his second professional tournament. But that was the beginning of Pinehurst getting big time golf back on its agenda and uh, Pinehurst management even at that time was looking at a U.S. Open. They even had some conversations with the USGA but because at, th at that time the USGA had never taken the Open south of the Mason-Dixon line because to play it, David as you know the USGA demands firm and fast surfaces, quick greens and you couldn't get, at, at that time Bermuda greens were not the technology had not evolved to have them this far south and have them firm and fast in the summer. So that's one reason that the U.S. Open was never played in the south. And that was one reason that Pinehurst was, was not a possibility for a U.S. Open until the evolution of technology and, and agronomy that allowed them to build a green that could be firm and quick during June. So Diamond Head did some bad things. They also did some good things. Well, you know, I also kind of, I forgot about it, but at the Hall of Fame tournament, yeah. and it was originally sponsored, it was the Colgate Hall of Fame, yeah. and they had pro-ams, and in the pro-ams, I mean, James Garner, Bing Crosby, um, well, President Ford came for uh, the, uh, I guess it was the first. 74. The, it, yeah, the first one when they came and they um, opened the Hall of Fame, and he came and talked, Ben Crenshaw was there. But lots of, uh, they had people like Foster Brooks and Phil Harris, you guys probably don't even know who they are. But um, had lots of pictures, and Mamie Eisenhower came and toured, so it was a big deal. And the Hall of Fame was, was another well-known tournament that didn't last very long, but it, it was another attempt at bringing, bringing um, 
famous people to come and golf in high dollar tournaments. And as I say, Colgate was a sponsor in the beginning. I don't think they did it until at the end, they hadn't. But it, it was an important tournament to get back here and started getting people noticing Pinehurst for big time golf again. Yeah, uh, just to add, to the history of Pinehurst is very much the history of grass. Uh, which is a double entendre, I just realized. Anyway, uh, for, until the mid-30s, uh, Pioneers had sand greens. Uh, and since the middle 30s, uh, when Bermuda greens were installed, uh, it, the, the number of grasses that people, uh, various uh, Ross and, and, and Tufts, and then into Diamond Ed and, and, and Sense, and of course, you're all familiar with you know Champion Bermuda and Mini Verde. But prior to that, they tried all sorts of strains of bent grass. I mean, the quest was to have bent grass, fine bent grass greens. And to be honest with you, I don't think they ever got there. I don't think they ever found, uh, this is mid-south. This is just a tough place. You know, it's not south uh, where the heat can, can give you good Bermuda greens and it's not the north where you can, where you can have uh, bent grass greens. And out of number nine, yeah, playing in the summer, they have to water the greens so much, it's, they, they become mush. But frankly, in the fall and, and in the cooler weather, they're really fine greens. But the struggle to find the right grass uh, has been a long one. Well, the, the, the transition to Bermuda grass from sand greens brings up a question. So when we look at Pinehurst number two, which we'll all be playing tomorrow in the rankings, it's listed as 1907 Donald Ross, which might lead somebody to believe that the golf course that they're playing tomorrow appeared exactly like that in 1907. So just would welcome comments from the three of you about your impressions of how the, the perception of, the personality of, the reputation of Pinehurst number two has evolved through the years mm -hmm. from its creation in 1907 to today. Well, David, I wasn't here in 1907. Yeah, yeah but you're a historian. You can yeah. figure that out. No, that, that, that's, a, that's a really tough question. And I, I think <clears throat> there's a, a gentleman, in, uh, Jan Ludwig, probably knows more about the, I mean, he knows when they cut down a tree on number two in 1932. I mean, he's really made it his retirement life work to uh, notice as much as he possibly can. The one thing I will say is I'm of the opinion, and I think Jan is too, that the greens are as much the product of top dressing and changes since 1940 as they are of original design. Uh, I think they've become elevated just a quarter of an inch at a time, uh, you know, year after year after year of of bunker sand being thrown up on them and then being top dressed with sand. Uh, I've seen pictures of the first green that, uh, from uh, the 30s that don't look uh, maybe a foot lower, maybe more, uh, but that the place has changed over time just naturally. Audrey Lee, just thoughts on how number two's evolved through the years and its reputation? Well, if you're talking about the reputation, I mean, it has only increased. But as far as how the course, I mean, it's great effort was made to make it m the way it was Ross, Ross's intent. And um, one of the things, like with pine needles, when they, they, they cut down trees because the trees start encroaching. And yeah. one of the things that Ross was known for was um, rewarding a good shot. And as, as the time goes on, lots of trees grow in and encroach, and nobody wants anybody to cut down a tree, but that's one of the things they did at Pine Needles. And it's, you know, you have to, maybe you have to do some hard things. And just like Bobby knows, you know, people were like terrified when they started doing number two. But I know you know how much water you guys have saved and all the things, and, and people, people love it now, but it's, Nobody knows for sure if it looks the way mm -hmm. Ross did it, but we have a lot of pictures. You can go back and look at the pictures, and it it really looks like the beginning. And and you have to, if you go all the way back, nobody wanted to play that course because there there was no real grass, and there were 
um, it wasn't picked up. There were cones and sticks everywhere, and and the caddies carried around a piece of refuse carpet on a rope to sort of drag all the furrows out of the sand greens and everything, just try to make it the least bit playable. So, Speaking of sand greens, so you had a sand green for a while at the Tufts <laughs> Archive. So explain yeah. if somebody's never played on a sand green, what a sand green is and how it's prepared and how do you play on it? Um, it's, it's really different. Uh, the sand greens were huge. So some of them were square around, but they were like 40 by 40. Or, and, and sometimes they would even put, after vehicles came to Pinehurst, they had refuse oil at the garage. And sometimes they'd sprinkle oil and water on there and make them nice and hard and firm. And um, it was just a really, I mean, they're just huge. And we had one in the back. And uh, it, we got permission to do it for uh, uh, a month or so. But it ended up being there for about two years till I got tired of keeping it up because every time it rained, all the sand ran away and there were pine needles on it all the time. It was a full-time job keeping that sand green playable. But we had a little sand box and you took, you took a handful of sand and there was a bucket of water. You put your hand in the bucket and made a little pile and that was where your ball sat because the tee hadn't been invented yet. I think the golf tee was, wooden golf tee was something like 1912. So you made this little pile and then, you know, the, you would, you would tee off and whatever, and then when you got down to the sand green, if it happened to to be um, loose sand, then you made this little trail. And as I say, the caddies carried this carpet that they just drug across and made it smooth again. But it, it was really interesting. And in a lot of the pictures, people look at them and go, oh, you had snow. It's like, no, <laughs> it's not snow, it's the sand greens. The sand were, was very white. And um, they tried that, like the village green was barren in the beginning. They didn't know how to make small grasses grow. And Leonard Tufts went on a trip with Warren Manning, who was sent to Pinehurst to put the Olmsteadian plan into effect for the village. James Walker Tufts went to the offices of Frederick Law Olmsted and said, I want you to design my New England style village. And so they, he came away with the plan for Pinehurst after paying $300. And so Warren Manning came, and he's the one who is responsible for the greening of Pinehurst, basically, because it was, it was just a, it was the Carolina desert. But they couldn't get the grass to grow as the plan it had for the village green and the deer park and whatever. And Leonard, Leonard Tufts went on a trip with Warren Manning up north, and it was a car trip, and we have a journal in there where he wrote, and that's where Leonard discovered there were cattle feeding and you know and everywhere that the cattle stood for any length of time was this really nice green grass growing <laughs> and he's like ah manure and so then they realized that they could actually come up but that's kind of how they started working on the grass and they wanted the pga was coming in 1936 and they wanted grass greens because they knew if they were going to attract the pros they'd been playing on grass up north and so that's what they wanted to do was have grass greens. And so that's one of the things that started. They started in 1935 on some of the other courses. And then they started, then they planted grass on uh, number two. But that's, that's how long it took because they just had problems keeping and maintaining grass. Well, yeah, the, the, like I said, the history of grass is a big deal. I was just in there thinking nothing has done number two more good than Payne Stewart's ability to putt under pressure. Uh, I, I kind of was here before the Payne Stewart Open, and then I was here after. And I think people come in now with the idea that they're seeing that open course that Payne Stewart made that famous putt on. And of course, the, uh, the resort has marketed that very, very skillfully. You probably saw the sculpture today, the statue of, you know, his pose and all that. I think it's really been different after that. You know, I think the national reputation of it as, as, a, as a, and the 18th green particularly in that putt has, uh, you know, I've talked to people from Pittsburgh not long ago who were here and they wanted to see that. They wanted to go out and see where his drive landed and the shot he had from over that little bunker and where he pitched the ball up to and then where he pitched it. And, you know, it's, it, it's almost, uh, uh, God forbid, a religious site 
Uh, and I think that's done number two a lot of good. Well, and the, tr the tragedy though today with number two and courses like Augusta National and so many is, is what equipment uh, clubs and the golf ball have, have done to them. I remember coming across a, some publicity material from the 1951 Ryder Cup match that was held here that had a hole by hole description of every hole and what most professionals then how they would play that particular hole and the first hole was a driver and a six iron the second hole par four was a driver and a three iron uh, the sixth hole a par three was a three iron the eleventh hole was a driver and a four iron or a five iron and the pros today uh, uh, not even the pros the the kids playing in the north and south amateur you know so many of those holes they're hitting nine irons and, and pitching wedges in and it totally takes out the strategic element that, that Ross had built. You know, one of the things that just consistently over a century that people have marveled about with Ross's ability to design a course was the strategic element and providing a, a safe way to play a hole and a more aggressive way to play a hole and the need to establish where the pin location is on a particular hole so that you would know which side of the fairway gives you the best angle to attach that to attack that particular pin and that's that's totally lost now I mean these these pros now and even the long amateurs uh, you know they just they just gouge it out there hit it as long as they can they don't even stop to look at where the the hole is because it really doesn't matter because they're going to be hitting a short iron into it so you know that's one of the the bad things about it but you know what are you going to do about it but and one quick thing on sand green so a pet peeve I have is I refuse to write the word sand greens. I always say sand slash clay greens because that's what they were. If they were sand greens, they'd be like the beach, but they were a mixture of clay, clay. with sand mixed into them to give them a little bit of, of texture and a little bit of uh, hardness to it, but, but they were certainly made of sand and covered with sand. Now, there were formulas that people had for the mixture that you use, the idea was to create uh, a pool table out of dirt, is what the idea was. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's made, I, I think that actually, that's very interesting. We have this professional, good amateur uh, criteria. And there's no doubt in my mind that the distance has, has really reduced uh, number two in a, in a lot of ways. However, I think you have, people like me. Uh, uh, you know, I have a six handicap. I go out there, I'm 75 years old. It's really a challenge. That challenge is still there. And you can see the designs. When you play, are you going to play tomorrow? I'm number playing two? number two tomorrow. I think that the first hole that I would think about and I would try to get in my mind is the sixth hole, which is a par three. And I think the, the virtues of number two are, are seen there and I'll just leave you to watch the shot value, I think is still the same as it was, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, there are a lot of holes out there. The other thing that you will notice, and it's really odd, is the par fives are uh, very easy in relative terms. Uh, they're, I think, uh, easy to play. And so I think the one thing I would do is I would try to give a judgment of the uh, of the par fives, which have gone through a little bit of a transition. Four used to be a par five, five used to be a par five, and they've gone back and forth and so on. So four and five are very interesting to think about in terms of would you have them be a par four or a par five? Uh, and eight is an interesting hole, very short, uh, birdieable hole, as is uh, 10 and 16, the par fives. So, you know, in terms of, you know, pros going out there, it's, that's a different world. I don't pay attention to those people anymore. They're not even humans, they're automatons. I have no idea where they came from. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, for me to model my game or think about golf in their terms, it's just not possible. But I don't see any of them here, so it, I think you're all normal players. So look at number six, think about the par fives. That would be the first two issues I'd have. So following along those lines, what Lee and Audrey and Pete, as uh, having had different roles here at Pinehurst and, and living here in the community and spending a lot of time here, what do you think that's something that first-time visitors miss 
when they're playing the golf course, when they're here, uh, what do you think is important about Pinehurst that they, they miss and you would encourage them to keep an eye out for? Oh. Are you talking about the course or the village or just the I Pinehurst The way experience? it all works together. It all works together. Well, they have to come to the Tufts archives. <laughs> <laughs> it's very unfortunate when people come and do not manage to get there. I know you all want to golf, but you know maybe some rainy day you can come in. It's it's amazing what what interesting things we have in our little museum. Um, I had no idea when I came. It's just really um, to to hold a piece of paper that Donald Ross wrote on and and to hold his actual drawings and everything was amazing. And when I went, people say, "Oh, do you have any of his autographs?" I go, "Yeah, we got thousands of his letters that he signed. We've got, you know, I mean, it's just." And and just some of the other pieces that we have, it's it's a very interesting little museum. So you have to do that, and you know, you of course have to play the golf course, which is on your agenda. But you should just walk around the village because many of the buildings are are virtually unchanged from the day they were built by James Walker Tufts. The the deli was the old department store, and the casino building is now a real estate. But that was where the offices were. And there used to be like a, the only change is there used to be a stairway going up, and the caddies and maintenance, everybody who worked outdoors or anything, came up that way, and got their pay right out a window because they didn't want to track in grass and crud and stuff like that. But it's just it's it's very unique because it really does look. If you look at old pictures of the village, you say, oh my God, that's there, that's there, that's there, and. Um, one of the changes that that was purposely done was that when they built the Magnolia, if you know, if you go, it's it's a really cool building. If they when they built the Magnolia, it was like five stories, had a little, you know, but had a little sort of cupola area. But when when the Carolina was built, you couldn't see it. Like people would say, where is it? Well, it was right there, but this big building was in front of it, so they took two stories off. And you can go in, and, and when we have the kids come in, I do little fact scavenger hunts, and I said, go find the stairway that goes nowhere. You can walk up the stairs there until your head hits the ceiling because they just chopped it off. And, uh, but otherwise, there, and we have still like 35, 34 of the original 38 cottages. A lot of them have been changed, and you wouldn't recognize. But most of them, you can see the actual cottage in there, and it's really, really fun to see see those things, and it still amazes me that in a six-month period of time, they created a village out of nothing in, at the turn of the century. Yes. Uh, I have friends who come down, and I have people who I barely know who come down and stay with me uh, because they want to play golf. Uh, and I have three things. I think you should go eat breakfast at the track, okay? Uh, and if you can't find the track, ask somebody, they'll tell you. Uh, and then I think you should probably go out to Robert's Golf, which is a bastion of humane capitalism uh, in a sea of not humane capitalism. Uh, and then I think the third thing you ought to do is get in a car, and uh, I, I agree with, with Audrey, you ought to look around the village, but I think you ought to drive out and get a little bit of a sense of the country around Pinehurst uh, and you will realize uh, that you're in the South. Uh, uh, if you stay in the village, you can come to believe you're in New England uh, because that's what it was designed to look like. It was designed to look like a New England village. Uh, and it even has, what, is it Harvard Square or Harvard? The streets, the buildings yeah, are all The streets are all places. New Englandish and so on. Uh, but you're not in the South. Or you're not in the New England. You're you're in the South, and there's a lot of beautiful country around. Go out to, and you'll see, you know, some different stuff. Um, uh, so those are the three things I'd do if I had some time away from golf. Well, I'll just piggyback on Audrey with the village because it's what really gives the place its appeal and its special feel. I've talked to people over the years. Uh, one man first came here and roamed around the village a little bit and called it Brigadoon. You know, another guy said, well, this is a movie set. You know, this isn't real. Um, another story from some 
folks who arrived in the middle of the night when it was dark, they stayed in the Magnolia Inn. They stayed in the room that looked out over the front, and they wake, woke up the next morning, and the sun was coming up to the east, and they walked out and just saw the village splayed out in front of them, and they immediately uh, decided this is where we're going to live. So th th that's how a lot of people get here. Is they, you come to Pinehurst, not many people come here passing through. You know, they come here because they're coming here for a specific event or the golf, and they come here and they just fall in love with it. So it's just the, the village and the, the pine trees and the sand and all that gives it its very special appeal. It kind of has a unique um, sort of streetscape. <laughs> and when, when I first came here, the, the streets didn't have names, and most of the cottages didn't have addresses. They go, go, to, yeah. go to Thistle Cottage or go to blah, blah, whatever. And um, the Olmsteadian design was curvilinear streets because he abhorred the grid style of New York and Boston where he had worked so much. And so he came and said, oh, look, we can do this or that. And the, he didn't come. It was from topographical maps. I misspoke, sorry. But people got lost all the time. And people come in the Tufts archives and say, do I, do I need to use my car to get to the hotel? No, it's, it's virtually it's a block and a half away if you just walk right up here and go that way. But it's, it's just, you know, people, people got lost all the time. And if you went when it was dark, there were no street lights either. And if you went over there at night to go visit somebody, you would drive around, you know, like, um, just until you found something that you finally recognized. But it, it really was kind of funny. But that was another thing about it is these charming little streets and, and the, the, uh, sand clay pathways and no parking and all that sort of stuff. It's just Pinehurst. So final golf question. Uh, how many rounds, and we talked about this a little bit last night with Tom Pashley, Pete, how many rounds, and same for you, Lee, and Audrey as well, how many rounds did it take playing around not Pinehurst number two before you felt like you finally understood the course or that you kind of got the questions that it was asking you? Hmm. I probably played it three dozen times and I still haven't figured it out just because of the greens. Um, I know where to hit the ball and I know the layout, but uh, there, there are spots in and around the greens that uh, are new every time. And it's a never ending process to figure out what is the best shot to play. Uh, you know, sometimes you're lured into trying to loft a wedge shot, which is usually not the right way to do it. Um, um, if you go along, bump it along the ground, you got to figure the speed out, uh, which is, uh, I have seen innumerable people play ping pong on greens, you know, going, going back and forth uh, just because of the speed. But um, I, I think that the advice from the caddies uh, holds up pretty strongly that as soon as you can get it on the, the quickest you can get a chip shot or pitch shot on the ground and let it roll, the better. Uh, that's an interesting question. Because it's clear that when I first played it, I had a, a kind of, this might be, you know, sort of, I had too much respect. I was playing on sacred ground. It's just a golf course, <laughs> uh, uh, and so on. And then I think uh, the, the attitude I took was that there are about five or six shots that it asks you to hit, and they're hard shots. And you will discover that right quick on number two. The second shot into number two is just, I don't know how you do it. If you, if you can figure out a way to hit the green, uh, you should let me know. And then I think you go around and you'll discover that the, the place asks you to hit shots. And I like that. I like standing on the first tee knowing I'm going to try to hit number two. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to play the ninth hole, which is a wonderful, very hard part of three hole, and so on. I'm going to have to hit a shot. And that's just the way that I've evolved into that, and to the point where I don't really care what I shoot anymore. Just enjoy hitting the shots. Well, we've reached our appointed hour. I just wanted to thank Pete and Audrey and Lee for their accumulated time and experience. It's a privilege to have people who've spent so many years studying and thinking and caring about a place. Uh, thanks for sharing your time and your insights with us. Appreciate thank it very you, much. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure.